It's been a little while since we've come to a shoot 'em up on this chronological foray into the Game Boy library, although 1991 has already given us Parodius and R Type, both of which are phenomenal games. Aerostar marks Vic Tokai's second attempt at the genre after the Sega Mega Drive title Whip Rush. I've remarked before just how strong I think this genre was on the system. There are plenty of really good installments of classic franchises like Gradius and R-Type, together with some outstanding standalone titles like Chikyu Kaiho Gunzas and Mercenary Force. Where does Aerostar fit in? Well, it's certainly on its own in terms of other versions. There were no sequels to this, and the Game Boy version is the only one. After the end of the Sixth World War, the Earth has been rendered inhospitable and uninhabitable by humanity. Following a long period of time, the Intergalactic Council wanted to send humans back to Earth, but found that the long-lost wastelands were now plagued by mutants. Rather than send an army, the ever sagacious Council sent a lone fighter called Aerostar to win back the Earth. The game is an auto-scroller, but the ship needs to be driven. It doesn't scroll along with the screen, but rests in place on the map, meaning you have to move yourself forward. The reason for this quickly becomes obvious when you consider the game's main gimmick. You're not a plane, but a sort of hover car that can only travel above certain roadways and can propel itself into the air with a jump. The game is focused almost entirely around this mechanic, as you need your jump ability in order to dodge an otherwise certain death bullet load, and most pertinently, launch yourself from platform to platform. You're largely driving along roads that are almost like piers, and many of these come to dead ends, meaning you'll need to propel yourself vertically – it looks like you're coming out of the screen – and maneuver across water or chasms, landing safely on another platform. It's quite easy to do – you press and hold A when your jump meter is reasonably filled, but beware as later on you don't even have roads – you can often be confined to jumping between various tiles. It's best to wait until a lot of charge is available, else you run the risk of not making your jump. Don't let go of A until you're ready to land, else it's the drink for you. Also, bear in mind that while in the air, you can't fire your weapons. Pay attention to the enemy's projectiles – the large ones will only hit you if you're in the air. They're meant to look higher up, I guess. Otherwise, just ignore them – it's the smaller ones you need to focus on. It's quite tough to balance destroying enemies and dodging projectiles at the same time as route planning when you'll need to jump and which level of bullets to avoid at which time. Along the way are destroyable weapon tanks, which drop lettered power-ups. You can cycle between them by shooting the collectible, and the weapons are nicely varied. There are two side additions. Collecting S gives you two side shots with a medium range, or O gives you two flanking shields. You can't have both, sadly, and both have their uses. Don't be without one or the other. As for the weapons, there are three upgrades. L gives you lasers that travel through enemies without dissipating, basically an invulnerable version of your basic weapon. They also split and bounce off horizontally sometimes. B launches missiles slowly, but with massive impact. V creates five flames that fly forwards in a spread shot. Spread is often one of the most useful weapons in any kind of shooting game, and it's no different here. Lots of enemies come at you from the sides or diagonally, and seeing as how you can only shoot forwards, it's incredibly handy to have a wide dispersal. There are seven levels with a serious incline in difficulty. The game's not unbeatable, but it'll hurt you trying to do it. With a well-constructed soundtrack, beautiful and varied scenery, and some grotesque mutant bosses, however, at least the ride is a rewarding one. Don't let the initial difficulty put you off, because you'll be missing out on a unique, intense blaster that holds its own against its much more famous colleagues. The US and European releases are unfortunately pretty costly. You can get a Japanese one for a chunk of change less, and there's no text in the game, so you may as well. That Western artwork is gorgeous, though.
Thanks so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts on the game down below, and if you can spare a second, give the review a quick thumbs up, it really helps out. Subscribe to the Portable Power Podcast for a new Game Boy review every day from Monday to Friday. Or alternately, new episodes of the podcast drop every Saturday and Sunday on whichever platform you get your pods. See you later on.